we live in a world with intractable problems. We've heard about it all day long. Global warming, our economies falling apart, governments collapsing. And in your own life, you might notice a place where that impacts you, where you feel that intractable problem. Or where you have intractable problems of your own. Stuff you've been dealing with, sometimes for months, sometimes for years. But what if there were no problems to be solved, just more truth to be revealed? In 2006, I transitioned from a career at Microsoft to a career in personal development. And early in my career, I was coaching someone who hired me to solve her problems. And I was working really hard to do just that. And in the midst of one of our conversations, I heard this little voice. And it said, Jeffrey, there are no problems to be solved, just more truth to be revealed. Stop trying to solve her problems, just reveal more truth. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> it's like, Jeffrey, there are no problems to be solved, just more truth to be revealed. Stop trying to solve her problems, just reveal more truth. And what I noticed as I started to take that philosophy on is that my focus started to transition from this issue in her life to what wanted to open up in her life. And it became a philosophy that's impacted so much of what I do and, and how I work. In fact, a few years later, I began teaching marketing to purpose-driven entrepreneurs. And of course, you know, in marketing, one of the first things we ask is, what's the problem your service or business solves that someone else is willing to pay for? And so we are searching and scanning the world for problems. As I blew this up, not just to the individual or to the entrepreneur, but to our global economy, I started to really be amazed at the collective energy we have of focusing on problems. Just think with me for a minute about all the people around the whole world thinking about and focusing on problems they're solving all day, every day, 365, 24-7. That's a lot of focus on problems. Of course, we know that whatever we focus on, we get more of. And so for me, it started to answer the question, how have we gotten here and why? You know, earlier today, we heard about some of these intractable problems. And I believe that we've blown this problem up to an exponential level that is not sustainable. But I also believe that we're in the beginning of a revolution right now. A revolution of a whole new way of thinking, of sharing with one another, and of experiencing life together. It's the beginning of what I would call a transition from a problem-based economy or a consumption-based economy to a truth-revealing economy, which we may also call a contribution-based economy. Now, there's an interesting thing. I've also taught life purpose work, and one of the things I saw there was that there's this relationship between our childhood and our greatest challenges and our purpose and our greatest gifts. And so I started to look at that in relationship to economy and say, oh, goodness. OK, as little kids, at some point, we lose our inherent sense of worth and value. And what do we do in response to that? We go out to mom and dad, mostly, and we try to please them as best we can in hopes that they will praise us, that they'll thank us, that they'll love us. I think we do the same thing in business. We say, what problem do you have that I can solve? And if I do it well enough, will you praise me? Will you thank me? Will you reward me with a paycheck or money? Kind of just like mom and dad. <laughs> but I also see us really moving from this old paradigm of problem solving 
to this new paradigm, and I believe conferences like this are indicative of that move. I want to share just a little bit more about how this plays out, not just on perhaps a global level, but in our own lives. One of the people I had a privilege of working with is a woman who grew up with a mother who was suicidal. And somehow she knew she was the one to keep mom alive. And so over many years, mom would fall into depression and she'd lift her back up. And mom would fall back down and she'd lift her up again. Time and time again, mom would fall down, but she'd find a new way to give her mother hope. I'm glad to say that today her mother is alive and well. And so is her hope-giving skills. In fact, I would say she has a life PhD in hope-giving. Today, she's one of the top salespeople and managers in her company. And I'm sure if you ask some of the top people in her company what's so great about her, they'd say, oh, well, it's her numbers, it's her revenue. But if you ask the people she works with, they would say it's her hope-giving skills. When they're having a tough time and don't know how to make that additional call or keep moving forward or take that additional step, she always knows just the right thing to say to lift them up and help them take that next step forward. Now, there's an interesting thing about these challenges from early on in life and that I believe they serve us in our training program. But there's a critical transition from the training program to the gift they have to offer us and us living from that gift. In other words, I would say that our challenges have a half-life. There's an expiration date, if you will. And how do you know the expiration date has arrived? Because they flare up. They're like flags waving us over saying, hey, I'm ready for transition. There's something new to be revealed here. I think of it kind of like there's a big open beach. Nothing on it except a flag waving us over. And underneath the flag is the truth that wants to be revealed. It's a buried treasure. What I think most of us do in life is we walk over to that flag, that big problem in our life, and we start smacking it. <laughs> we try to get rid of it. We hit it, and we hit it, and we try this way and that way, and it just doesn't move. Well, what if it's not supposed to? What if it's a marker for you saying, hey, dig here, more to be revealed here? A couple years back, I led a large event, one of the biggest events I'd put on, and at the end of it, I had so many people coming up to me and saying, oh my gosh, it was the best event I'd been to. And I kind of knew that it was some of my best work. You know, you changed my life. You changed the way I think about my business. Thank you. But I walked away cold. I didn't feel the impact of their love. I gave, but I didn't know how to receive. And so, Using my own medicine, <laughs> I went on an inquiry about that. Okay, what's this a marker for, this thing? Because I want to be able to feel more. I want to be able to share with people and feel that in a reciprocal relationship. And what I discovered was an old abandonment wound that I wasn't even aware of. And I discovered that early on in life, I made a decision around this abandonment. Oh, I need to be self-sufficient. I can't rely on other people. And so I'll just be really, really competent. <laughs> and the benefit of that, the training program of that, was that I did get really good at a lot of things. And it served me well in my career. But when the training program was over, there was a reclaiming of that aspect of myself to find more of my heart, more of my love. And I'm happy to say that today I feel like I serve people with a greater capacity to see them, to honor them, and to support their expansion. I have another small example, and this is just a daily life example. 
I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about this talk, and she said, oh, gosh, Jeffrey, do you remember the first time you told me about this philosophy? And I said, no. She goes, well, we had, we had dinner, and I was telling you about problems I was having with my son. 15-year-old kid, great kid, but it was really hard to get him out the door in the morning. He loves video games and loves staying up late to play them. <laughs> she said, before that, I was trying to fix it, to solve it, to try to change him. And you know, underneath that, it actually turns her son into a problem, into something that has to be broken for her to fix it. But she said, after that conversation, I started to see it not as a problem, but as a conversation. I got more curious. And as my curiosity grew, our conversation grew. And as our conversation grew, our relationship grew. And over time, I noticed it just was no longer an effort to get him out the door in the morning. So I have an invitation for you. Think for a moment about your seemingly intractable problem. It might be something simple in your life, or it might be that problem you've gone to over and over and over again. And maybe say, oh my gosh, am I here again? And wonder for a minute. What if it's not a problem to be solved? What if it's a marker of more truth to be revealed? What does it have to offer you there? And now join me for a minute in thinking about us all taking our global collective problems and finding the gift of them and bringing those gifts out into the world, moving from this consumption-based economy to our greatest contributions. I believe we will create not just global, sustainable, economic development and prosperity, but also global, sustainable happiness. Thank you.